guys welcome back to my channel if you haven't been here before my name is Amanda and I like to cover cases that just don't sit right the case I'm going to be covering today is the case of Angel Bumpus it's another case out of Tennessee and this one was requested by quite a few people on my last video and make sure you stick around after this case for a brief update on the Purvis pain case if you watched my previous videos, you know he was scheduled to be executed this past month on December the 3rd. And that brings us to our current case that happened in Chattanooga, which is in East Tennessee. And this case involves Franklin Bonner. He was a 68 year old retired public works employee who was born and raised in Chattanooga. He had two children, a son and a daughter and he was married to his wife, Linda, in 1990. They would have celebrated their 20th wedding anniversary the following month. He was known by his friends as Franklin Cookie Bonner, and he was also a known numbers runner in the neighborhood and sold small amounts of marijuana to people that he knew. His wife, Linda, would go on to state during trial that her husband would buy a pound at a time and then he would sell it to working people for recreational use. She said that they were careful to only sell it to people they knew and would often deliver it so there would not be as many cars coming and going from their house. Regardless of this, his family would describe him as a wonderful, fun-loving, kind-hearted man. On Friday, January 16th, 2009, Linda Bonner picked up some sandwiches and took them home on her lunch break to have lunch with her husband. They spoke regarding the birthday party they were attending later that night, and she went back to work. Sometime around 2 to 4 p.m., Mr. Bonner was killed. Around 5.20 that evening, Linda returned home to find it ransacked. Upon entering the home, she found the kitchen table turned over, the cabinets open, everything was thrown out onto the floor, and her 68-year-old husband, Franklin, was lying on the floor. He was bound to the kitchen table and chair. He had actually been bound and gagged with duct tape around his feet, arms, head, nose, and mouth. She tried to cut the tape off of his face with a knife, but Mr. Bonner was already deceased. A medical examiner would later determine he had suffocated when the duct tape was placed over his mouth and nose. Being that he sold marijuana and was a gambler, detectives believed that this was a robbery gone wrong. The neighbors last saw Mr. Bonner around 2 o'clock that afternoon, shortly after his wife went back to work. Franklin's murder had gone cold for nearly 10 years. Franklin's wife and granddaughters often asked the detectives if they could take another look at the case. And when the cold case unit with the DA's office finally reopened the investigation with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations, nine years after his death, they were finally able to name two suspects by matching fingerprints in a database. On March 3rd, 1995, Angel Bumpus was born to 16-year-old Tamika Bumpus. And just to give you an idea of her life and how she ended up where she did, it's imperative that we discuss her upbringing that was less than ideal. At the age of six, her mother was arrested and being held on forgery and identity theft charges. On the way back from a court date, she was being transported by a deputy when she proceeded to take the deputy's handgun and shot her in the chest. Then she turned the gun on a passerby and stole his pickup truck. After she was caught, Tamika Bumpus pled guilty to the 30 charges against her and was sentenced to 40 years in prison at the age of 24. She will not be eligible for parole until 2042. When her mother was incarcerated, Angel and her six younger siblings went to live with their grandparents, Shirley Bumpus and Bayless Smith. Angel was described as a shy kid and she excelled in ac academics. She was an 8th grade honor roll student at the time that this crime occurred. She moved to Louisville, Kentucky at the age of 16 to start a new life for herself away from her grandparents, who she stated were not affectionate, never told her and her siblings, I love you, never tucked them into bed, nothing like that. 
The Bumpus family was also known around Chattanooga due to their multiple run-ins with the law, including Angel's grandmother, who was arrested six times, and her brothers and uncles, who also did time in jail. Once Angel separated herself from her family, she enrolled in community college, which allowed her to work a full-time job to save money to move to New York City to work in fashion. Just before the move, she found out she was pregnant and decided to take another path to become a nurse. In 2017, Angel was arrested on failure to appear for a speeding ticket and her prints were taken. Her fingerprints were then matched to prints in the murder of Franklin Bonner. Nine years after Bonner's death on June 14, 2018, Angel was a 23-year-old mother of two in her second year of school at Jefferson Community College. She was accepted to the nursing program and scheduled to begin the program two months later in August. Around 6 o'clock that morning, two detectives came to her door, shockingly, with a warrant for felony murder and especially aggravated robbery. Angel was arrested that day and given a $30,000 bond. In presenting the state's case, the prosecution told the jury that Bumpus and a 26-year-old accomplice, who we will call Mr. V, and you'll find out later why I'm not stating his full name, the two went to Mr. Bonner's home to rob him. They stated the duo attacked him and restrained him with duct tape before ransacking the house. The state decided to try Angel Bumpus and Mr. V together as co-defendants. Linda Bonner would testify that the couple kept a safe in the house and she was the only one with the combination. Not even her husband knew it. At the time of the murder, Bumpus lived with her grandparents, who reportedly bought marijuana from Mr. Bonner. In fact, the last call Mr. Bonner received the day he was murdered was from Shirley Bumpus, Angel's grandmother, and she is also the last known person to have seen him alive that day. During her granddaughter's trial, Shirley Bumpus recalled talking with investigator Carl Fields in 2009, but recanted her story during trial, denying that she ever spoke with Mr. Bonner the day of his death, although cell phone records prove otherwise. Shirley went on to explain that although she helped raise Angel, she and her husband lost contact with her when she turned 16 and moved away. They both seemed certain that Angel had never set foot in Bonner's house, and despite their association with the victim, Angel had never met him. However, Shirley Bumpus was, in fact, a suspect during the early days of the investigation. Because she was the last person to call or see the victim mere hours prior to the murder. However, it is still unknown why they did not investigate her further. Angel states that she never had a close relationship with her grandmother, so it is possible that her grandmother would let her take the blame for a crime she committed if it kept her out of prison. Another part of this case that cannot be overlooked is the fact that Angel's grandfather, Bayless, used to do work for Mr. Bonner in his home, and he said that he would take a lot of the tools from his garage at angel's house and take them to mr bonner's house to work on things like such as duct tape for instance he named that as one of the things that he would take from the house and he also stated that angel spent a lot of time in the garage uh, working on her crafts and she would often use the duct tape so imagine if you had a roll of duct tape and you peeled a piece off and then you grabbed it to tear this piece well, there's two partial fingerprints right there on a piece of duct tape. It's back on the roll. So if someone takes this duct tape somewhere, lays it down, and then someone else comes along and grabs it, your fingerprints are going to be on that duct tape. And that's one thing that I don't think can be overlooked in this case. Angel and her alleged accomplice, Mr. V, were both adamant that they did not know each other. And when the witnesses testified against him, they also testified that they didn't know Angel, nor had he said anything about Angel's involvement with him, or for that matter, that he even had a, an accomplice at all. There were no phone calls, no texts, no emails, no pictures found that could link Angel and Mr. V ever at any point in time, yet they were co-defendants in a murder trial. County Medical Examiner Dr. Metcalf 
testified that suffocation was the cause of death of Franklin Bonner, but he had other injuries. He also stated there were abrasions and lacerations on his arm and at least four blunt force wounds on the victim. At least one of the injuries was to the victim's head. A breakthrough was presumed to have happened when a federal inmate convicted of a bank robbery came forward to say that Mr. V, his cousin, was behind the murder. According to him, his cousin confided about the murder and said that he duct taped someone up like a mummy and it went wrong. What the inmate said about the crime contained details including how Bonner was found at the crime scene and hence his cousin was regarded as a suspect. The inmate never stated there was another person at the scene of the crime, much less an underage female. However, later he said that he had come to know of the case through the lead investigator in this case, Carl Fields, but we will get into those details in a minute. The inmate's story then dramatically began to change on two accounts, in the version of how the crime took place and in how he learned about the crime. He was suspected to have been talking about the case to get his own sentence reduced. The only evidence against Angel in this entire trial was two partial fingerprints that supposedly came from the tape that, we, that was used to tie the victim up. The tape in question also had nine other fingerprints that are unknown and to this day were never identified. A hair was later found on the duct tape as well. The hair was also never tested. Angel's lawyers never received the original duct tape to conduct their own research on the print. The prosecution stated that the duct tape was no longer available. Only a picture of the tape and fingerprints were allowed as evidence in trial. So let's get into fingerprints and the laws of Tennessee for a minute. You have more than 150 ridges in a single fingerprint. In the state of Tennessee, you only have to match 12 of those ridges to determine that this person committed this crime. 12 out of 150. Other states require up to 20 to make a positive match. However, the prosecution admitted during trial that there were nine unidentified fingerprints on the tape aside from just Angel's two partial prints. I should also add that the duct tape was destroyed after testing even prior to trial. After the state rested its case, both Mr. V and Ms. Bumpus declined to testify in their own defense. And Angel's attorneys laid out her routine the day of the murder. Her school bus arrived home around 2.45 every afternoon, which leaves Angel an hour and 15 minutes to walk two and a half miles down the road and rob Mr. Bonner. Her defense drove the distance between the homes and there was no sidewalk at any point between the two homes. It would have taken her at least 45 minutes to walk to his home, which would leave a maximum of 30 minutes or less to rob and ransack Mr. Bonner's home without being detected. In defense closing, they stressed to the jury that the state wants you to believe that a 13-year-old girl walked two and a half miles to the home of a man she had never met to go meet a 26-year-old man who she had never met to commit a robbery, which I felt was a powerful statement given the evidence. It only took the jury four and a half hours to find Angel Bumpus, who was 13 at the time of the murder, guilty of first-degree felony murder and attempt to commit especially aggravated robbery in the 2009 killing of 68-year-old Franklin Bonner. Mr. V, her co-defendant, was found not guilty on both counts, which is why I chose not to use his full name in this video, but if you research it, you'll find it. Angel, who is now 24, was immediately taken into custody and sentenced to 60 years in prison. She will not be eligible for parole until 2070. At the time of the murder, 10 sets of fingerprints found on the duct tape were run by Detective Carl Fields to reveal that it did not find any matches. In 2016, Fields was booked on several charges of sexual harassment, coaching witnesses, official misconduct, and tampering with or fabricating evidence. His actions led to a murder suspect almost getting his case thrown out on technicalities, and this is believed to have a significantly impacted the Bonner murder case as well. Police state that when investigating the crime, they were investigating it as a robbery, and there were fingerprints and hair found all around the couple's home. However, none of them match Angel Bumpus. 
This leads me to question that if they believe she committed this crime, how could she have possibly only left two fingerprints on only the duct tape, not the doorknob, not the light switches, nothing that she would have touched without thinking about it, just on two pieces of duct tape and not only that, but only two partial fingerprints and all of the duct tape at the scene. A huge piece of this case that I cannot get over are Angel's brothers. In a recorded phone call from prison, two of her brothers were recorded speaking about Angel being arrested for this crime. It's such powerful audio, I wanted to play it for you because I do not feel me stating it to you will do justice to everything that's said. So, listen for yourself. This call will be recorded and subject to monitoring at any time. Hey, you guys all having a uh, What happened? It's on case to have a nine years of, of murder and an uh, aggravated robbery. And they did. They put that for it. Happened nine years ago. Yes. Uh oh. Nine years ago, two thirteen. Come on now. Think about it. They called. The recording you just heard was not shown to the jury at trial due to it being considered hearsay. So let me know in the comments your opinion of that recording as I have my own, but I like my viewers to make their own opinions when it comes to these cases. Now let's also discuss the fact that 73% of violent offenders have a criminal record. How does an honor roll student go to a stranger's home to rob and murder him, yet continues on with life, goes to college, becomes a mother with no other criminal charges for 10 years besides a speeding ticket before she's accused of the crime we're talking about today? If the crime occurred, as the state claims, how was she able to wrap a grown man in duct tape from head to toe and only two fingerprints were left on the duct tape? Why were the other nine fingerprints never matched prior to trial? And if there are unmatched fingerprints, why would you feel the need to destroy the duct tape? Another question I have is why was her grandmother the last person to see and speak to the victim before his death, yet she was never charged with anything or even fingerprinted? This case leaves me with so many questions. What were her brothers talking about in the recorded jailhouse phone call when one stated, think real hard about it? A huge injustice to Angel by her own attorneys in this case is the fact that the judge instructed the jury to judge Angel at the age of 13 and not 24, which was, which was her age at trial. The jury was given not a single picture of Angel at 13 years old. Her lawyer stated they felt it was irrelevant to the case. However, had they shown a photo of her at the age of 13 and stressed that she weighed a mere 80 pounds and was 5 feet tall, that would have been beneficial, in my opinion, to Angel's defense. So an 80-pound 13-year-old girl killed a grown man all by herself. This is what the state wants us to believe. Angel actually wanted to testify at trial, but her attorneys would not allow her, stating if she was not there, then what kind of story can she really tell? They also stated that the jury only wants to know how her prints got on the duct tape, and she cannot answer that question for them. However, if she's innocent and could testify in her own defense, how could the prosecution trip her up in any way? She stated that she wanted to be heard by the jury. She wanted to be, to be able to say, I did not do this. And her attorneys continued to discourage her, which ultimately led to her not testifying in trial, which could have actually benefited her greatly. A website dedicated to overturning Angel's conviction, which I will put a link to in the description, states that she filed an appeal on December 20th, 2019, and originally had a hearing scheduled for February 7th. It was later pushed back to March 27th, but her court date has been moved again due to the pandemic. Her appeal is currently on the docket for next month, February 26th, 2021. I would like to hear your theories to the questions I just raised. I would also like to hear your stance on this case. I was surprised at how little information I was able to find despite digging deep for weeks. Her trial was also not televised, so it was difficult for me to gain any information on what actually happened in the courtroom. 
if you watch this video through to the end and believe Angel Bumpus was wrongfully convicted, I encourage you to sign the petition that I will link in the description. I also encourage you to write the governor of Tennessee, which whose mailing information will be posted below. Most of all, share this video so we can reach more people in fighting for Angel's rights. Whether you believe she's guilty or innocent, the prosecution did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that in and of itself proves there was no justice in this case. Not for bon Mr. Bonner and not for Angel. Now for a quick update on the Purvis Payne case. On November 6, less than a month away from his original execution date of December 3rd, Tennessee Governor Bill Lee granted him a temporary reprieve of his execution due to challenges caused by the pandemic. Basically, they are just po postponing his execution until it's safer to carry out. His new execution date is April 9th, 2021, and I know that while most would like an update that he was exonerated, this additional time will allow his attorneys to investigate the case further. And the results of the DNA testing that was supposed to be completed in November has not been made public information as of yet. But when that story breaks, I'll be back with another update. If you haven't seen the coverage on this case, I will leave a link at the end of this video and encourage you to watch and share that video, video as well. One more thing I want to address is that I would like to apologize for taking so long to get around to recording this video. I started a new job, graduated with my bachelor's degree, and the reason I don't specify that I will have videos a certain day every week is because I dive deep into these cases and it takes me weeks to give each case the attention it needs. Otherwise, I would just be reiterating what you could read on a local, local? what you could read on a local news story. I also work a full-time job, so I'm not able to use YouTube as a means of main income like some other channels are, and therefore I'm unable to give you a weekly video. However, it's my goal moving forward to at least try to get a video out once a month or every two weeks, but it really depends on how much time it takes me to investigate these cases. So if you want weekly videos, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. I am working on a case that's not actually in Tennessee. I know, shocker. But I am hoping to get it out to you within the next couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. And thank you for watching if you actually made it this far.